Hello and welcome to Warhammer 40k Book Club. This is episode number nine, in which we're discussing Apocalypse by Josh Reynolds. I'm Jen Bozier. And I'm Carrie Honey. And this is Warhammer 40k Book Club, where we read from a crag. Every episode, we discuss a book that we've selected from the Black Library's Warhammer 40,000 catalog. We post the book on our website, wh40kbookclub.com, along with questions to ponder during reading. Listeners are able to read the book and then tune in and hear our discussion. We encourage participation via Twitter, the site, or Encrypted Box channel. Spoiler warning, if you haven't yet read the book, go ahead and visit the site and check out the book in questions and then come back and listen to this episode as we'll be discussing the book from start to finish in great detail. As mentioned, this episode, we're discussing Apocalypse by Josh Reynolds. The book is about Imperial Fists, White Scars, and the Raven Guard who are sent to an ecclesiarchal world to protect it from the word bearers. Secrets are revealed. Word bearers are likable. We posted several questions to our followers, so let's dive right in. First off, did you like the book? Yes. A thousand times over, Ow. yes. <laughs> I think I, you know, I feel like we say this a lot on this podcast, but I don't, I can't remember the last time I had such a, oh my God, reaction when I was reading this book from start to finish. Yeah. Uh, depending, you know, it's not been all week like in my yoga classes and everything i can't talk it's just been terrible <laughs> um but yes yeah, from you know the beginning where i was like okay oh, man an imperial fist i just don't know but it's everybody around him is just amazing mm -hmm. the word bearers funny like i can't say they're likable but funny oh i love i liked a map mem. you know I if there's i liked a apis apis that's what and they, his his little cronies. Okay, the ones I like the most are probably Gernt and Saper, because when yes. Apis first meets them, and I'm just there cracking up at their little oh interaction. My God, Apis so is like, so are you nice. finished? Yeah, I love that when he's just like, oh, he's going to come complain about the Legion. Stop it off. Then he starts complaining, and they're like, there we go. <laughs> so great. They're undeniably evil, and yet he gave them personalities, which, did you see that coming for word bearers? No, because the my only experience with word bearers, aside from Erebus, mm -hmm. fuck Erebus, fuck Erebus, was is, when I was reading the uh, Blood Angels omnibus because that's who they're fighting against is word bearers, and the right. only and the word bearers in there they were just disgusting and mean and evil. Like there was really no personality beyond them other than if we don't like you, we're just going to kill you for no apparent reason, and sacrifice you sacrifice you know our own people to possibly win favors with with the gods and and make this other play so there wasn't too much to really like about them then so this was really my right. first experience with them you know actually having a personality and you know a lot of the chaos marines i feel like they either they're they're either imperial fists with no personality or they're like the white scars and are hilarious and have all this personality. Right. That Yeah, I think that's pretty accurate, especially as we read as, as many as, of the Traitor Legion books as we've read this year and that we've read in the past. It's, yeah, <laughs> like they come in two flavors. They're either just, I'm evil because I'm evil and bah! or shocking amount of personality. And I laughed so much. Well, I laughed a lot through this book in general, but some of them are rather sassy <laughs> and catty. <laughs> I must have made that comment to my husband because he read the book before I did. I must have made it aloud like six times where I was like, sassy space marine is sassy. <laughs> <laughs> and then we once the dreadnoughts show up, they're sassy, especially the white scar one. I just. Oh my God. The white, <laughs> the white scar dreadnought. When his handler was like, I don't think they know who you are, old man. Why don't you tell them? <laughs> I am the white wolf of the lake. I'm like, I don't even know what that means. And it's amazing. <laughs> well, and I love when he wakes up and he's like, is that you, Eric? Only you would ha talk to me in such a way. <laughs> like, so I, I know we've kind of bled into this already, but what parts really stood out to you? Oh, man. So <laughs> where to start? Right. Um, so Subodin, really anything with him? Because he anything was just hysterical. Um, like, I think I marked down every single time, the time that he made a joke. Um, let's see. Oh, I told you this earlier, but I did write down 
when uh, some of the Imperial Frists were going over uh, saying Dorn had, and I'm like, <clears throat> wow, a little on the nose of that Pink Floyd reference, are you? So about how that each soldier is just another brick in the wall. Uh, I didn't take it as a Pink Floyd reference. I took it just as like a, this is how much we don't really value human life. <laughs> it's like, everybody's just another brick in our defense. Like, they, all they think about is in terms of walls and defense. Because so the other, other things I wrote, I wrote down was uh, a Matt Nim's theory on life and servitude. I especially enjoyed his, um, why he likes the Eldar wine the best. <laughs> he said the bitterness <laughs> of a failed race adds to the wine. Oh, I loved that. And actually, I, and I loved this quote because it really kept through all the way through the book. The gods only promised glory, not that you would live to claim it. Yes. That, and we'll talk about this a little bit more about this. This book really revolved around faith. And as such, there were a lot of just really neat scenes in here about that. But so... Yes, we'd already talked about the I am the white wolf of the lake. Hear my howl. Oh my god. As soon as the dreadnought showed up, I have a thing for dreadnoughts anyways, because they just they always seem so full of personality. <laughs> They've lost all pretense, right? They know they're not advancing. They know they're not getting killed. Well, it's very difficult to kill them. So just whatever's going through their minds is coming out. And they're always salty and sassy and just so much fun when they show up. Um absolutely loved him i you know some of the little things that i really liked uh like there's um i think i have it it's on page 117 whatever the whatever a matinin talks about the sisters mm -hmm. he has like this strong respect for them and he always talks about not underestimating them and just this whole thing where he talks about um when Yattle calls them wretched animals, and he's like, yeah, no, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> these guys these guys are a problem because they fight with fire. Um, I mean, even Atthus said they were brave. Oh, yeah. It, so that was kind of neat to me just to see. Again, I like, because I think it makes them all the more evil, I like seeing the civilized traitor marines where, you know, he has respect for their enemy. And, like, as soon as they find out it's Imperial Fists, they're like, oh, boy. All right, so we're going to be in for a big fight. And they know everything about them. And they're like, all right, so now we know how to approach this. They're not just like, oh, flies that will kill. So I think it makes their evil all the more repugnant, right? Because they have this, because they're not slathering maniacs. I just, there's so many little things like that that I love. And of course, we talked about this a little bit before the podcast, but this, particularly cracked me up is when they're making the defenses. I think it's on page 198 when they're making the defenses for the town and one of the guys is trying to like small talk with the Imperial Fist <laughs> and he's just like, what? And it finally says, he was finding the rhythm of it now. It was not a transfer of information but simply noise for the sake of noise. He could not see the purpose of it but he would not be found wanting. Like, he... It reminded me of, I don't know if you've ever seen that cartoon about the difference between type A and type B people and the type B person tells the type A person to stop and smell the flowers. So the A person like smells all the flowers and because of the flower smelling champ. It reminded me of that where I was like, this guy's like, I'm going to conquer the shit out of the small talk. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm just... going to be the best at small talk there is. Exactly. Like My Primark will be proud of me. Which is funny because Doran was very personable, actually. But and then yes. of course, and I was thinking that this whole way through because like, I've only uh, experienced Doran just a couple of times, and that was in the Horus Heresy, where he's um, talking with with he's there in a meeting with Horus, and one I think it might have been Torgadon made some crack about how the Imperial Fists don't have a sense of humor, and Doran like whips around, he's like, well, I take personal offense to that. I'm funny, and they're all staring. I'm like yes you know and yeah. and when dorn uh was talking to garrow mm -hmm. after he he retrieves them and he gets very emotional and you know knows how to talk to the mortals as as well as the other uh imperial fists and so to see like some of these imperial fists just be so bland and cut off i'm like you didn't get that from your Primark. I don't know if you guys just became as boring as the walls you build. One of the things that I really loved 
it was sad, but I loved it. And you can see a little bit, it, it explains a lot about the Imperial Fists, is when um, Calder is fighting uh, a Matinem, mm -hmm. and he's sword fighting him. Earlier in the book, Calder talks about how he learned in the way of Sigismund. That is why he is superior. And then at the end, when he's fighting a Matinem, he's like, oh, yeah, you guys all fight like Sigismund. He overextended himself back in the day, too. He at least knew to protect himself. But, like, you can see Sigismund, especially post-heresy, you can feel his fingerprints on the Imperial Fists of this serious, we're not messing around, we are angry, we're mad as hell and we're not going to take it anymore. You can really feel those fingerprints on the Imperial Fists, I think. They're less like Dorne and maybe more like Sigismund now. But I love that. And, of course, my boys, the Raven Guard, so many... There's a scene early on when one of them is talking about how he was hunting the cyber cherubs for sport. I was like, oh, you. <laughs> I just, it's the Raven Guard. Apologies, I've been sick all week. <coughs> it was the Raven Guard just being the Raven Guard. And I loved it. There were so many little, I feel like this book was made up of, yes, it had its big epic moments, but it felt to me kind of like the Avengers, bear with me. They bring this team together of all these people together and there's just all these little small moments that make it this wonderful experience mm -hmm. and it's really how they find a way to work together and how well they complement one another and in, in the end that they're fine okay you know what you guys you guys are gonna you know uh stabilize all mace cool We'll, you know, we'll go do the hunting. The White Scars and the Ravens like to do the hunting. And the Ravens are the ones who are doing some of the sneaky stuff. And the White Scars are just going out there and going, come at me, bro. <laughs> Which is just delightful. I love the Raven Guard's form of uh, void fare. When, how just sneaky they were. And taking out so many ships. And then just, you know, bolting. Um... So no one really even knew who was there until it was until it was too late. It was, mm -hmm. it was so great, and then how it all really came together, and they were all in their little pieces where they needed to to be. Um, and, you, and it was hard because you could tell that Calder was he's socially awkward, and he has no idea how to deal with either one of these. And the and Subodin, the uh, White Scar Khan, is pretty much just like, dude, just chill. Like, I know I outrank you. It's fine. I don't I don't want this circus. You just go send me out to go hunting and we're gonna be happy. Mm -hmm. And and he you know, the Raven Guard, he's like, Yeah, I don't care. Just what do you need me to do? And they're the ones who actually bring personality. Very much so. To and him. I think so that was actually one of our questions was Imperial Fists, Raven Guard, and White Scars. Oh my, <laughs> did the chapters blend well together? And on the surface, I kind of, when I first looked at the book, I was like, why these three? Like, that seems a weird combination. But the way that Josh Reynolds shapes this battle and this whole siege, it's wonderful because as you said, they all just click in line. You have the Imperial Fist who's doing as one does, building walls and defending everything, and the Raven Guard are out hunting and terror not to make them sound like the Night Lords, but they were kind of terrifying people, like when they hunt down all of those uh the criminal organizations. Mm -hmm. Okay. It was terrifying. And funny. Oh, hilarious. Oh my god, I laughed so hard with most of that, especially when he's just like, Don't make me come back here. <laughs> like, you will be here at this appointed time, or I will come for you and you will not like it. Because, because I'm sure he liked this so much, <laughs> you know. To be oh right, with. like the guy was like, "Well, this is fine." Oh yeah, no, I absolutely loved that. And with the white scars, and so they mention or earlier, Sabodin mentions that a lot of the space marines don't really have a head for void warfare because it is a big, slow. I think I feel like at this point I need to like have a jar for every time I mention the Night Lords books, but like, like put a dollar in. Um, but at one point they talk about Void Warfare in there because one of their, uh, Vandrid, the captain of one of their ships is like a master at it, right? And he talks about it being this very slow ballet, like Tai Chi. And I loved it. Of course, Sabotin's like, I love this. <laughs> like, a lot of people don't. I do. And it somehow 
he manages to take this thing, which is very slow and very cumbersome, and make it really compelling. Probably because it's the White Scars, and they keep talking about themselves as the hunters on the prowl, right? And they that. like to make jokes. And they're yes. funny. Oh my god, so much more. And poor Calder. Like, the Imperial Fists are kind of boring. They're a little milk toast as is. I mean, they're lovely people and they make great walls. Um, but compared to like Karos and Sabotin, I was like, oh, you poor thing. Like, I liked the Calder chapters, obviously, because they were very important. But I found myself kind of being like, get back to Karos, get back to Sabotin. Yeah, like, I, was kind of, I was kind of that way too. But one thing I'll say about Calder, though, is that he, uh, you know, he shaped up as it went on like he was oh, playing the so. ecclesiarchy's uh you know games for a little while and then we got to the point he was just like okay you know what i'm done playing yeah i'm done <laughs> to which karis was like i would have done that like you know forever ago and at the same time though karis was the one who told him he wasn't very polite and he's like i was very polite they're not dead <laughs> oh my god i laughed so hard at that and part of me was like <laughs> Is he joking? No, I don't think Calder <laughs> knows how to joke. No, I don't think that was a joke at all. But like my first reaction, like if you would like, you know, when you read stuff, and you're like, how would I react to this in the scene? Like, <laughs> uh. Well, and when he said that at first, I was like, that's kind of weird. And then later, it's funny because Karos, we were talking about this earlier when they're on the mining planet and the Galba, the enforcer guy keeps running his mouth. All of a sudden, Karos is like, yeah, take care of that. They kill him. I was like, oh my God. And my first thought actually is I was like, I guess that wasn't very polite. <laughs> well, I mean, he did warn the guy twice to stop interrupting him. Seriously. I mean, I think you would take that the first time. You were lucky you lived through the second time. But the third time, he's just not playing anymore. Yeah, no, you were warned. <laughs> and it was actually a very tactical thing because he was in a he was abusive to his charges and he was probably yeah. the reason why they were revolting. And Karis even said that later. He's like, I had a feeling if I killed him that you guys would be more willing to work with us. Was I right? And they're like, Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. But it it was two things, right? It was like, look, I've killed the guy who was a jerk to you. Also I'll kill you if you don't step in line. Right. <laughs> Which I I don't know. I again, when I first came to the book, I was like, "That's such an odd combination." But after having read it, I was like, "Oh my god, these guys work together great!" Like, I think we can agree from the end of the book, there's going to be another one of these. I'm so excited. I I don't know if it could be a direct sequel though to this though, just because they've made a big deal with these conquest books. Is that yes, there's going to be so many conquest books, but each one is like its own conquest. And that's not to say that they're not going to reference things that happen in other battles, right, because right. these are all Gulliman's plays. He's the one who's directing all of these. Um, yeah. And, uh, but I don't know if there's going to be a sequel. It might be a spinoff in a way that will reference back to this because there are things that were revealed that we can't just be like oh that was a one and done thing no like <laughs> this like totally shook everything i have a lot of questions about this book and i put it out on twitter and i was like it's like does guy Haley know what you have done with gulliman and josh reynolds replied he said no not really no but i think it's fine and Guy Haley said, nope, I don't know, but it's fine. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, yeah, sure. He's just totally rewritten stuff, but it's fine. I mean, obviously they, they do. Obviously, right, obviously they, they do. They do. I know. I was making a joke and they just Oh, no, 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 for it. sure. So, well, I'm trying to think of like, which question would you go to next? Well, no. so let's, let's begin at the beginning and say okay. that despite this being a conquest book, and I'm, I'm going to directly, I'm going to respectfully disagree with Mr. Reynolds in his beginning, his intro to this book. He says that the book isn't exactly about faith. I felt that this book, if I were to describe this book, other than saying it's the most important lore book that's currently out, I'm not kidding. Um, it felt no, that's not what he said. Originally, said not, this this wasn't going to be a book about faith. Oh, and then he says like it's not entirely or something or like that. Perhaps it's not. It's not entirely, but faith is nonetheless right. at the heart of the conflict. Yes, and this 
book, I felt that the book, I felt the whole heart, I really disagreed and felt that the heart of this book was faith. Absolutely. It was faith about the Imperials, faith about chaos, redeemed faith. Um, do you feel like you have a better understanding of both the Imperial and chaos faith from this book? I, um, from the way the word bearers explain it with faith, mm -hmm. I understand their faith. I heartily disagree with their faith. Right. Because even, you know, uh, I mean, in Christianity, I mean, we do believe in demons and all that, and you can worship them. And that is a type of faith, but that's not a good faith. And I think we can all agree that's the same for, for chaos. And, you know, and I, I haven't really gotten to, you know, why exactly Erebus fell first, not Erebus, fuck him, like why Lorgar fell first in the Horus heresy. But you've explained to me that it was really more Corpheron and, and Erebus who were like, well, if the Emperor is not a god, then there's got to be gods out there. And then the uh, the Pantheon was just like, sup? <laughs> Pretty much, well... We heard you're looking for a god. <laughs> I thought I had the first, like, that's why I was looking around, is I thought I had the first heretic, like, right here. I was going to be like, like, in this book. Um, but I don't. Doesn't matter. Um, so you learned that Corferin actually originally worshipped the four chaos gods. He didn't call them that. But so then when, you know, the emperor is just like, I'm not a god. Yeah. Corferin and Erebus, you know, Tweedledee and Tweedledum, both sitting there like, I bet y'all know where the real gods are. So bad. Um, but <coughs> the thing I found really interesting about this is that we've seen so many examples of imperial faith, right? And them say the god emperor is with you. Watching the word bearers, especially a matinee, talk about how the gods are with us or they aren't with us. The gods are at our back. It felt, it felt less fanatical and raving and more very much like the mirror, this dark mirror to the imperial faith, or as you said, like this Christian faith, right? right. Where they, they don't speak about the gods as being like these evil, awful presences, just these, you know, yeah, the gods are at our back. We must do as the gods will. And exactly. they, they almost make it sound downright rational, which that was a little bit of a shock to me. Well, these word bearers make it sound rational. I mean, right. the word bearers I read and the uh, Blood Angels omnibus when they were talking, you know, they did talk about the Pantheon there and what they're trying to do to get, you know, Lorgar's a uh, favor again, have him return and, and all that. Um, but they were still, they were crazy. They were just oh, yeah. batshit crazy. <laughs> and these were very much like, no, we're going to, we don't know what the will of the gods is, or I think I know what the will of the gods is. We will find out depending upon what happens. Like they really do go in this thing about, you know, what's supposed to happen will happen. And it's a very um, laid back point of view, especially compared to, oh, I don't know, corn. Well, you know, one of the things that was really funny about this that I noticed a lot is that they did talk about how, okay, we have to make sure that we're currying all the gods favors equally, but they really leaned heavily into corn. I mean, there was a little bit of Nurgle. They mentioned that Zinch was kind of hanging around yeah. and that the Dark Prince was, but boy, did they, I mean, how many times did we see blood letters show up in here? Yeah. And I thought that was more yeah. Lacmu though. It was, it was, but even a Matinid said, he's like, okay, we've got to have somebody go out and build a pile of skulls. And again, he said it so naturally, <laughs> right? Like, okay, we got to make sure we have the communion wafers and we got to make sure that we have this mountain of skulls. And Union it was just like, well, it was, it was just like a checklist. Like, okay, so, you know, we have to do all of these things. And um, again, he made it seem so rational, but it was funny to me. So the part that stood out the most was that they keep talking about Erebus. And they keep talking about Corferin, which we'll talk a lot more about that later, but how they're constantly scheming and how all of these gods, like, oh, we have to appease all these different gods. And there's all this scheming and control and weird stuff going on. And then they go over to the ecclesiarchy where there's all these politics being played and all these cyber cherubs going around recording people. And you know, there's a line, I can't remember the exact line, but um, it's when one of the battle sisters is talking about canoness lore. And she's like, you know, oh yeah, she always interprets what the god, what uh, the god emperor says in the most aggressive way possible. And 
it, it really was this mirror for these two faiths and how much and I know that I know that was entirely the principle of this was just and it was so weird to see it reflected back because you'd be reading stuff and you'd be like uh and then you go over to the ecclesiarchy side and you're like oh <laughs> like, oh god <laughs> this is not good this is not good at all and um and just the lies the secrets and the lies and the half truths on both sides oh yeah and the fanaticism and i think that was what that was what made i almost kind of wish that the sisters would have taken a slightly bigger role in this book because it was zealot versus zealot kind of like spy versus spy 80s references um but there, there's a, especially an interesting part where they're talking, we'll talk more about this later too, but where Ken and us, Laura is talking about um, their strategy when they're crashing their ships into the city. And she's like, that's what I would have done. And my first reaction was, of course you would, you zealot. Oh, oh wait, the word bearers are zealots too. <laughs> right. Yeah, whereas, you know, the Imperial Fist is just, but this is like standard, like protocol. Like you, why would you do that? Because you would have all these risks and it doesn't make any sense to them. But it's like, yeah, but if you don't care about those risks, right. YOLO. <laughs> no. Right? No, for sure. And I just, I guess I, I liked seeing this commentary that, look, this is just two sides of the same coin here. And both sides have some problems. Right. Right. Yeah, it was a, the, this book, I mean, you always see a hint of it, like, especially with the Dark Imperium books, but there's like, you know, something rotten in the state of the ecclesiarchy, which yes. I think goes with any time you have a religion ruling something, it yeah. never, it never goes well. And you're, and I'm a religious person and I s strongly believe that, you know, religion and politics should be. 100% separated because nothing good comes of it. You see it in history. It's definitely going on in here. And it, and whether the um, chaos Marines want to admit it or not, they have their own ecclesiarchy going on. They're letting their faith run everything for better or for worse. And for both sides, it's for worse. There's not much better going on on both sides. So along those lines with their own ecclesiarchy, so despite Corferin, Erebus, and Lorgar not being present in this book, because Lorgar is off meditating. Um, <laughs> uh, did he take his toys and go home? Yeah, so the official lore is that he ascends to demonhood, and then he goes off and he goes into a meditation state, which is important because you may it, may, it kind of directly reflects that of the Anchorite. He goes off and he decides that he's going to meditate for like 10,000 years and nobody's heard of him, and he is much like Jesus, prophesies to return. Eventually he will return when his sons are worthy and blah, blah, blah. And so that's kind of, and so he's okay. left Corferin and Erebus, the two biggest snakes, not even snakes, they're weasels, right? That he's left them to fight over and decide the true uh, ruling of the, um, of the word bearers. And despite them not being in the book, their presence is very much felt. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, you have Corferon versus Erebus going on. Like, within and, within these word bearers. And it really is. I mean, to borrow one of my favorite uh, examples from South Park, it really is shit sandwich versus giant douche. Like... I couldn't agree <laughs> more. There's no winner here. And it's so interesting to see this battle of theirs going on and one of the things that really stood out to me about that was early in the book Amatinum and Lakmu are kind of batting at one another and Amatinum mentions that Erebus Erebus seems doesn't seem to necessarily be playing for the home team because yes he wants them to appease the gods and to be this strong legion but never so strong that they challenge Horus and they always need to be in Horus's shadow. And oh, we should all Horus. Oh my God, Abaddon. Okay, I was like, <laughs> I was confused for a minute, but go on. Well, I was thinking that the talent. Okay, anyways, hi, Dave uh, <laughs> Page. Um, so, but they always have to be in Abaddon's shadow, right? 
and that they can never quite challenge him, they to he totally has their Legion's best interest at heart, so long as that's the same as the Black Legion's. Um, and he basically describes them as being lapdogs, and he's like, and so you can see that there's Erebus on, there on one side being like, okay, let's just be sycophants, and then Corferin being like, we need to embrace our destiny, right? And all the while, Daddy is nowhere to be seen. Daddy's probably just like, I don't like either one of you. He may not come back until Corferin and Erebus are dead. <laughs> You're like, now you all are worthy of leadership. <laughs> right. Right. Or does he come back? So, spoilers, as I mentioned, at this point, like, I feel like we've been talking about a lot of good stuff, but at this point, like, if you were like, oh, I don't know if they were joking about spoilers. Spoiler. The anchorite, the person who was not only responsible for transcribing the Lecti Lecticio Divinatus to the Ecclesiarchy, but also responsible for writing thousands of sermons and arguably the backbone of the entire Ecclesiarchy, the Anchorite, is none other than a word bearer. Transcribing all of Lorgar's past sermons and teachings. So... This is really like, you know, so when we read, it was Black Legion, I think it was, when mm -hmm. they discovered about, you know, the God Emperor and they burst out laughing and they said, oh my gosh, Lorgar wins. Lorgar wins. I had the same reaction because when I got to that part, I was like, the word bearers did win. Like, and he says, and so the long and the short of it is that he was there when, when, um, Monarchia was destroyed. He was part of the assault on Kalth. When he's in the trenches at Kalth, he has an epiphany that the God Emperor smote them as a challenge, as a test, to test their faith, and they failed that test. He surrenders to Gulliman. Gulliman, after keeping him in an oubliette, which sounds awful. Well, does an oubliette ever sound wonderful? <laughs> No, but whatever. <laughs> by the way, I can never hear the word oubliette without hearing it in David Bowie's voice from Labyrinth, because that was the first time I learned about an oubliette as a child, and so I'm always like, oh, like Labyrinth. Oh, they, uh, Gulliman then hands this guy over to the Ecclesiarchy as a prisoner. So, but was it the Ecclesiarchy, though? Because... When Gulliman uh, woke up, he was like, "What? what's this Ecclesiarchy crap? Right. So the people he gave them over to eventually kind of formed the backbone. Probably the administratum. Right. Probably. And, but, so you have this very powerful narrative of the chaos of the man who turned to chaos, realized he was wrong, and came back into the Emperor's light. What effect does this have on the faith of Imperials? chaos marines like i said i have so many questions about this because <laughs> so even said that when he sent the alert to gulliman it was ignored like gulliman was right. just like he's not gonna save the ecclesiarchy he's probably gonna be like oh whatever you know i, I got, got other i got other cry. problems i got i got a mortarian problem over here okay like i just can't do with you right now but then when they sent the secret code about the anchorite then gulliman sends people so the big question is what is gulliman's motivation with this was his motivation because i don't believe that he kept the anchorite there to eventually create a doctrine of the god emperor not with everything else he's been saying so my question is was his motivation to send them there to discover the Anchorite and destroy him? Or find out exactly what the Anchorite was doing? Because, yes, he forgot about it or just, you know, didn't, didn't think about it. But I don't think he expected That's the actually fact. actually what I imagined when he got that code is he was probably like, oh, God, that, that guy. guy. <laughs> and, and I'm not. Oh, my God. <laughs> and did he know that that's where this all came from. And I kind of go back and forth about this because, you know, one thing he got that chick. Anyway, starts with the Oh, y. yes, the really cool chick. Yes. I can't think of her name, but yes, yeah, the really yeah, cool chick. Yeah. 
And she fetches the original Lacticio Divinatus from the Inquisition. <laughs> and and it was written by Lorgar. So did he maybe know this was going on? Did he maybe think that this is really that the Ecclesiarchy did come from Lacticio Divinatus? Or is it he forgot about this guy, had no idea what the Ecclesiarch had been doing with him all this time, and maybe he had sent Calder and everybody there to not only protect the Anchorite, but maybe just to find out how he's been using, how he's been used on this Ecclesiarchy planet. Part of me wonders if he wasn't like, oh god, that guy's still alive. <laughs> like, well, I mean, it's been 10,000 years. Oh, I know. Right? Like, I, I genuinely in my heart I mean, I make a joke about it, but I really do think that Gullman was probably like, oh, no. Like, I totally forgot about this thing. How is this still a thing? Being the smart guy that he is, he probably put two and two together. So here's what I picture. You have this anchorite, right? This guy, again, he is the redemption story come to life. He worshipped the emperor. He fell to chaos. He came back. We'll talk more a little bit later about the miracle he performs. He is now blessed by the emperor. What a powerful narrative that has to be to some of the word bearers who they specifically mention in this book aren't necessarily wholeheartedly into worship and chaos. And there's a part in this book that I found very interesting when Lakmu is evaluating a matinee and he's like, oh yeah, you know, there's always the little, and we've read about this in Black Legion and the Talon of Horus about um, how there's always the little demons clinging around, mm. except not on a matinee. A matinee yeah. never has any of the demons on him. So part of me wonders if, because we've talked about how we think that this entire move right now with Gulliman coming back and the introduction, introduction of the Primaris, and I feel as though you saw this a lot in this book, especially with the OG Space Marines starting to become downright hostile towards mm -hmm. the Primaris. I think we're going to see a board flip. And can you imagine if the word bearers are suddenly like, oh, wait, we can just like leave this whole chaos thing and come back to the fold because our Lord and Savior, the God Emperor, believed in us all along. Likewise, does the Imperium start to fall? Does the Ecclesiarchy start to fall apart at the seams because it becomes revealed? Our entire Bible is a lie not a lie but you know what i mean your religion is based upon not only a lie but the biggest of lies a traitor primarch this is that's why i said like i made i made a joke i, I, I say it and it sounds kind of hyperbolic and silly when i say this is the most important lore book i think i've read all year this is the most important lore book i think i've read all year <laughs> holy shit like, again, this isn't just, oh, they got the Lacticia Diffinatus, and then they were kind of like, oh, I think it was Euphrata Keeler who wrote this. Confirmed word bearer. Yeah, when they, um, when Amatnim and Lakmu raided that library planet, and so he could figure out, he had an idea of where the Anchorite was, but he needed to look at this library plant to make sure he was in the right system. And when he finally explains to Lakmu like what he's doing, he's like, and I know Erebus sent you here to stop me. I'm like, well, what are they trying to stop him about? And then they're, they're talking about the books and how they twisted the words of Lorgar. And he's like, no, these are the original words of Lorgar and they were written, but look at the language they're written in. It's one of us. And immediately I was just like, holy shit. Like, not all, like, I knew everything was based off the Lacticia Divinatus, whether they knew it was based off of that or not, and they knew who wrote it or not. <laughs> not only is, it, is everything based off of that, but now you have an actual word bearer prisoner somewhere writing all this for you. How does that not turn everything up the, upside down? Like, I think I hear the Inquisitors being activated everywhere they all come, clutch their pearls and come take care of this problem monocles popped off right well and so what's interesting about that too is that erebus 
wants whatever this is to be destroyed. Lakmu, they, have, they don't know what they're going for. But Lakmu is under orders to find this and destroy it. And Matinin is under orders from Corferin to find him and bring him home. Why, though? You want to talk about questions that I have. Now, obviously, from Erebus, I could absolutely see why Erebus is like, no, 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 we do not want this. Because Erebus, and they make actually one of my favorite scenes, and I think you and I talked about this because it was so sassy, was when Lockmoon and Matinin are kind of batting at one another, and um, he quotes somebody, and Lockmoon's like, you know that's forbidden. And he's like, and Amatnin's like, oh yeah, it's forbidden by Erebus. Just like, you know, am I wearing the right paint color on my armor this cycle? Because that's how Erebus likes to control us, is by changing the rules every ten minutes. Right? And I was like, oh yeah, that's a really good point. Boy, would he really hate somebody to show up and be like, oh yeah, BT dubs, the Emperor forgives us. We all failed this test. Well, well you yeah. would think that that would also disrupt Corferon as well, though. Yes! So is this like a thing where like I wonder if Corferin So here's the thing though neither one of them knew and I would say even Corferin and Erebus don't know this cuz I don't think Erebus exactly knew what 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 right. he was doing he just knew that Corferin was sending him on something and he's like yeah I don't want that so you stop him whatever he's going to do or I, did he know that's you know I mean, did the dark gods whisper this to him? Like, you need to go take care of this little situation. Like, with him, who knows? But Corferon, I mean, it kind of came with this with the Matinim as well. And he said this, when he, got, and he had to get this from Corferon, that they believed that this guy was being held prisoner and forced to write Lorgar's original teachings. They that had, could be too, right? They, I mean, because he even talked about it. He's like, no, I need to rescue him and bring him home because he's being forced to do this. Um, which made me like, okay, and then Lachman, like, what's the big deal? If, like, why does Erebus not want him to come did back? Erebus, and maybe, maybe did it's because... Erebus know he didn't? He wasn't being forced and Aaron thought he was? Possibly. Possibly. Um, either, either way, and him coming back or him coming to light is going to shatter Erebus's little world. Oh, um, yes. Because um, Apis gets away. <coughs> he does. Apis and, he, and his two best people. Uh, you know, thinking about his two best people, I cracked up when Apis <laughs> said that there are entire religions below decks to avoiding Saber's eye. <laughs> I loved that so much when he talked about that. Because, I mean, again, again, so evil. So funny. Right. So irreverent. I mean, it was, yeah, just crazy. Because Apis was 100% on um, Amatnam's side. Oh, yeah. So he he's... knows exactly what is going on. And, um, and he's not as dumb as he lets everybody think he is. I love that he brought that up. So he is escaping, and he's going to bring mm -hmm. this back to Corferon. Right. This is going to shake up everything about the word bearers. Uh -huh. And the ecclesiarchy, because now it is out. It is open. We can't keep this a secret anymore. By the way, guys. So, you know that traitor legion? You know, the, the word bearers? Oh, no, I know. We don't say their name. But, you know, them? Yeah, they're writing all of our stuff. Because... all Again, this is all Lorgar. Because... That was because Lorgar was the first one to worship him as the god emperor. Yes. Well, and so, and here's the other thing that's very interesting about this is that he says, the anchorite says, as he, actually speaking of the Amatinim thing, I just have to say really quickly that I do love the scene when Amatinim is just like, look, I'm Amatinim. And he's like, oh yeah, I remember you. You're one of Corferon's curves. You used to like to burn books. They don't fight back, do they? The dreadnoughts. Sassy dreadnoughts. The dreadnoughts are so sassy. <laughs> so, <laughs> just picture a dreadnought doing a Z snap. <laughs> they would. Um, if anybody would in this universe, it would be them. Um, but, yeah. it. Oh my god. So, but the thing that scares me the most is that he says, the end, he says, I am done meditating. Which, what does that mean? 
Like, so okay, the big so, backbone of the word bearers is that, you know, meditation is so important to them, right? And so, again, Lorgar was promised, or it, it's prophesized that once Lorgar is finished meditating and he deems his sons worthy, he will return. The anchorite is done meditating. I was just thinking that, like, what if this is Lorgar? <gasps> oh, couldn't be. Because that would be then the dude, because remember he says he was just a dude that Gullum and what if, like, Lorgar is speaking through the dude? What? Dun, dun, dun! <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my god! So, and now let's talk about what word the anchorite speaks and why is that important. So, the word bearers, weird name for a legion, right? Legends I don't know. Meant. I thought it was very fitting for a religious legion, to be honest. Oh, uh, yeah, honestly, truly. But... They often refer to themselves as the bearer of the word. And it's, and I always kind of wondered. Oh, if, shit. Yeah. Okay, continue. So I always wondered if it, it seems as though the modern, the 40K word bearers have forgotten a key piece of their lore. And that is that the word bearers were literally the bearer of the word that is the na true name of the emperor. Like Steve. So they. <laughs> Sorry. I'm always just like, what would this guy's name be? Um, they know the true name of the emperor. So at the end there, when the anchorite utters a word in Colkin and the wings spread out. Dude, first off, can we talk about a Saint Dreadnought for a second? When it's like two, four, six, eight, twelve wings. I just, I pictured like legitimately a, le a seraphim. Yes, a seraphim. I totally pictured a legit seraphim. I think it was glorious, but like a mech seraphim. <laughs> like, this is really like, seriously, again, hardcore religion here. But he says this word, divine light banishes all demons. And when he says it, I, can't, I was looking for the passage here, but when he says the word, a matinin says something like, he's like, wait, wait a minute. Don't I know this word? And he couldn't like really understand it. So as we know, as has been established in this universe countless times, to know something's true name is to either control it or kill it. The Anchorite is done meditating and he knows the Emperor's true name. Where do we go from here? <laughs> Well, what I was about to say is, you know, the bearer of the word. Right. I, To me, that sounded very much like a religious cult. Absolutely. And, and that is because the opening sentences of the Gospel of John is, in the beginning there was the word and the word was God. And the reason why John wrote it that way is because at the time ancient greece ancient greece when they were trying to find their philosophy which always was the root of the world what makes up the world and it's always been different things like there was the gods then you had um oh gosh uh what's his name P um pythagoras so i found out how you pronounce it pythagoras uh pythagoras who his was the number that was the beginning well i forget this philosopher's name but his creation of all things was the word logos and so john wrote that because the gospel is written in greek he wrote that specifically the beginning there was word and the word was god to specifically get the greeks the beginning was logos and logos was god logos. i'm like 90 percent certain that's where Lorgar's name comes from that's about to say logos Lorgard. Dude, watch out! Watch the emperor's true name be Jehovah. Um, okay, that's way too on the nose. I mean, would you put it, Pe Ferris Manus of the Iron Hands? I kind of want it to be Steve at this point. <laughs> Just like Steve Rogers. Or watch uh, it be something even more boring. Have it be Adam. He never asked for this. <laughs> Not that Adam. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. I don't think the emperor asked for any of this. <laughs> so, okay. So here's the philosophical thing that I'm wonder I'm worrying about right now. 
what if the anchorite is correct? What if this was just a test? What if he went to monarchy and he was like, I am not a god. As a test. And the word bearers failed it utterly. And half of his sons failed it utterly. You know why? What if he intended Fucking this? Arabus. Anyway. Well, and because he wouldn't hug his children. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is known. Um, what if this has been his intention the whole time? I don't think his intention on time, though, is to be, like... A corpse on a throne? Okay. Yeah. You know, sometimes great sacrifices, okay? And I'm telling you, I'm still not convinced that he just needs to... That he doesn't just need to be killed so he can rebirth himself again. Oh, yeah. I totally think this is a dogma theory. situation. Yes! Totally. He just needs to be killed so he can be rebirthed. He's supposed and to then... go play skee ball in Jersey. Exactly! <laughs> <laughs> he didn't intend to be on the throne the whole time. He's just sitting there like, you idiots. <laughs> but this kind of goes back to, you know, because he spoke to Gulliman. What did he say? I, I want to think he'd say, like, it's about time. Or where have you been? <laughs> right. Like, oh, thank God. One of my tools has come back. Um, Or get me off this throne. <laughs> yeah. Do something. Please, the love of God. No, don't and, uh, take my sword. Don't take my sword. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Just take the thing at this point. Um, let's see. where was, I almost found the word, too. Think, a word from Lost Colchis. A word he had forgotten the meaning of, which spent a spike of pain through him. So, whatever he said. Logus. Orgar. Who knows? I just, again, I can't help but wonder if the Anchorite's correct. Was this a test that they failed? And is there redemption for the word word bears? Is there redemption for Lorgar? Is Lorgar going to come back and have the demon exercised from him? By the anchorite? I have no idea. But so again, what's Gulliman's role in all of this? Does he know? Is this going to be like his great shame now where he's going to be like, oh, God, damn it, I did this. Like, all I had to do was not give him this guy. <laughs> I brought on the ecclesiarchy. That's right. <laughs> there was there was an ancient episode of Powerpuff Girls from, like, the late 90s in which Mojo Jojo realizes that he creates the Powerpuff Girls and the whole thing, he, like, goes catatonic at the end of the episode and he's just like, it was me. It was me. I remember that. Yes. I just imagine Gulliman for, like, a few seconds just sitting there. It was me. It was me. <laughs> you handed this to Lorgar. But again, like, is this all predestined? I'm probably giving it way too much thought at this point, but... Well, you could easily argue, you know, after the fact that the Emperor knew this was all going to happen. Right. This is uh, all foretold. Right. Now, do I think that when they started this in the late 80s that they knew this is where it was going to go? No, I, I don't think so. But they left everything so open that it's perfect. So here's what I want to know. Riddle me this, Batman. Did Josh Reynolds... Is this guy such a mad genius that he was sitting around and he was like, you guys, I got it. I would love to think that's the case. Or is this like, like, is this like five or six people working together to be like, okay, how do we progress the lore? What needs to happen next? And then like a drunken conversation at a bar later, everybody agrees that yes, okay, we're going to have it be a word bearer. He's the whole reason behind the ecclesiarchy. Boom, done. Like, I would absolutely love to think that Josh Reynolds was like, guys, I got an idea. Well, I'm reading the intro. He talks about his pitch. He does, yes. Uh, so, I mean, it may have been one of the situations where he was like, guys, I have got this best idea how to kind of tie all of this in together. And and this this is what he came up with. And what a brilliant way to do it with a series. I'd be like, okay, it's a conquest series. It's just going to be about, you know, kind of like the, the older, the battles series, which I actually enjoy the battles series. They're oh, fun. Like They're fun action books. And that's kind of what I thought this was going to be. I don't know why, because everything is ever since Katia fell, it's just been mass chaos. It's such an exciting time to be a Warhammer 40k fan. Not if you're just catching up. 
I'm just saying. But no, I mean, I bought this book. I even I talked with somebody on Twitter the other night saying that I bought this book because I was like, oh, it's going to be a light and fluffy. And after reading the books that we've read, like after Spear of the Emperor and everything, where we were like, this is all kind of like heavy stuff. Even Trout of Night was a little heavy. It was a little heavy, right? I I wanted some. Well, and I, just, I guess actually after reading Shout of Night, I was like, oh, let's have something else that's going to be like bonkers battles. And there are a lot of fight scenes in here that are just great and good battles, but this is not light nor fluffy. Again, yeah, this is not another uh, Calgar Siege, one of those uh, those original battles books. Oh yeah, like or Ren's World or right. yeah, any of those. Like mm -hmm. again, point to me a book this year that is more important lore wise than this. Other than Dark Imperium? That's not this year. Oh, it wasn't, huh? huh. Well, it was Plague War this year. Plague War might have been, but a Dark Imperium, the first one was not this year. Right. I would say Dark Imperium. Right. Plague War. Maybe Dark... Plague War? No, I don't think Plague War was as, is as important as Dark Imperium. I would agree with it. Well, I mean, Mortarian, player two has entered the field. I still... There's... I think it's exited stage right. Yeah. I... Dark Imperium has set this stage for I everything. Agree. Ever since uh, the book Cadia Stands... And we go to Dark Imperium. Everything has changed. But so, yes, I guess going by books that have been published this year, I would say, yes, Apocalypse is probably the most lore changing book of this year. Maybe we should have known because it said Apocalypse. And they even say early on when they're talking about it being an Apocalypse, and they're like, oh, no, no, we're talking about the old version of the word where it's just a great upheaval and great change. <laughs> mm. I always like when they discuss the old Terran words. I do too. <laughs> They're just like, we're just going to go to Latin-y sounding words or things that you already know. There's actually, it's a Dan M. Net book and I can't remember what it is, but they, refer they reference Shakespeare. But the way that they do, I'm like, you guys. I've read one. I don't remember which one. They're all bleeding together. It might have been the Fulgrim Primark book. They actually, because of course he would quote Shakespeare. Cause of course he would. Actually, my favorite part of the the Fulgrim Primark book was is one of his captains who composes music while he's shooting people. <laughs> he like hums whatever he's been composing. I like it. Actually, I loved. Uh, oh was, my god! But during the siege, when all the sisters are singing, yes, and the imperial fists are like, "Do we want to sing?" And everyone's kind of like, "Huh." And then, like a paragraph later, they talk about the imperial fists singing too, and I'm like. All I imagine is like all these deep baritones joining in. <laughs> like, why not? I just, I just love them. Like, I can just imagine these big guys. Like, do you guys want to sing? Right. They're probably the same guy who mastered small talk. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. That guy is just like, I got this. I'm gonna master <laughs> singing too. Right. <laughs> so the Shakespeare thing reminded me of a quip I wanted to make earlier. Um. So one of my favorite of the Star Trek movies, aside from Wrath of Khan, because obviously that's flawless and can't be touched, Duh. Was, um, The Undiscovered Country, which is the one where they're trying to make peace with the Klingons. And Christopher Plummer plays a Klingon general. And that was how I pictured Sabotin Khan the whole time. I pictured him as Christopher Plummer. And there's a really great scene in there where Christopher Plummer is like, oh, Shakespeare is actually much better than the original Klingon. And it's wonderful. So I actually, at some points, I expected Sabotin to make a comment about that because they talk about them speaking the language of the White Scars. I expected him kind of to be like, oh, yes, as the ancient White Scar of Shakespeare once said, especially when he's laughing his ass off when he's fighting. God, I loved this book. Just again, from start to finish. And by the way, there are still, uh, this is a shameless kind of plug, but not that we get anything for this because we're not affiliated with Black Library, but if you can still get your hands on one of these special editions, do the thing the artwork in it is just phenomenal oh yeah oh it's so good oh and uh the nice quote on the back of the book that's metallic yeah cool. this book, but, but when the quote was actually said in the book i believe it was lacmu who said it i was like god true like i actually got chills like true words have never been spoken and it, not even in the same way i think that lacmu meant Right. Oh. They say at the end, it's, it was a victory. They're not going to live, but it was a victory. No, and that's why Amatinum, when he realized it, 
He let it. He let it happen. It's like this is the God's the, will. The thing that gave me chills is when he quoted Conrad Kerr's, and he said, you know, in the words of a great man, as a wise man once said, death and death is nothing next to vindication, which is so perfect because. The Primark book, Conrad Kerr's, actually finally answers 100% what he was talking about when he says that, because that's always kind of big, the big thing for him. And this, the word bearers were right. And the word bearers are going to be the ones to take down the emperor. Death is nothing, at least in a madman's mind. Death is nothing compared to vindication. I got chills reading it. Mm -hmm. Oh, just so good. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about really quick before we end, because it was one of the things that I think really took me aback was, and it's such a dress, a dramatic shift from what we were talking about, but Calder underestimated the word bearers from start to finish, right? And we really learned that in Canon S. Lore, again, I had mentioned Canon S. Lore calls him out on it and just says, your strategy sucked, right? And when she's, and when he's just like, yeah, I didn't really imagine them doing this. And she's like, it's what I would have done. Is this a flaw of him as an Imperial Fist? Or is it a flaw of him as a Primaris? Because again, a lot is made in this book about the OG versus the Primaris. At the same time, he was a Terran-born Primaris who has been put in stasis this whole time. We've seen a few right. references to this. I believe Felix is one of these as yep. well. Um, because they talk about the difference between vat born and newly made yes. primaris. What I think it is, I think it's more of it is partly the imperial fist, like you said, because he was really he was not really he suddenly met Dorn like twice, so it's more likely that right. he he uh, followed Sigismund. Well, and they like, said that he expected them to take the field like soldiers. Right. Uh, which these are people on the run, if you think about it. These are not, an, this is not no longer an organized legion of 10,000 people. It, gosh, who knows how many are still left in each right. of these chaos legions, to be honest. Um, I think it goes back to just, you know, him being trained by Sigismund, as well as not adapting with the times because I don't know when he was resurrected. So he's been in the stasis for 10,000 years. He only knows how they fight from back when he w was awake. And he didn't really fight the word bearers directly. He still has memories of when they stormed Terra and what happened to his family when they came to Terra, which like that was just, that was all chilling when he, when he that talked about and he t talks about that. But I think this is, honestly, I think this is, this is just a lot to do with, like, you know, Gulliman even says this in Plague War. He says that he and Dorne were both master strategists, but Gulliman was the offensive and Dorne was the defensive. Dorne was good at sieges. Gulliman was good at the offensive. So what we had here was someone who just built the siege According to, I guess, like their own little adeptus, you know, um, the codex, how to, how to, like, how to do a siege the Dorn way. <laughs> right. And that's what, and that's what Dorn did against, um, against the legions when they came and stormed Terra. And it worked. So why wouldn't it work this time? Because he's not thinking about the 10,000 years difference. And he's not used right. to working with zealots. Zealots. So the thing that I went back and forth on, and we've dealt with this a lot too, is that Gulliman is constantly pairing the Primaris with OG Space Marines because they don't have the combat experience. And you remember with the Imperial Fists and Shroud of Night, um, the Commander Imperial Fist is like, I just don't know about these Primaris guys because they don't have any combat experience. Mm -hmm. They don't have enough compared to like me, right? And that gets mentioned a few times in this book too. So was it just that? Or was it that he was such an Imperial Fist he doesn't understand the zealotry that he just like, well, of course, naturally they're going to want to come up through these ways that I've created the idea. And a matinee makes a nice little quip in here when they find out it's Imperial fists where he's just like, I'm not one of Perturbo's curs. I'm not down for a siege. Right. Like, so he wanted to get there like that and get at it. 
Right, which right then and there, I was like, oh, man, this is not going to go well with what Calder's doing. Um, so I found that, again, I found that very interesting because when Canon asked Laura, is like, that's what I would have done. I was like, dude, I felt like, um, what's his face in Alien? So I was like, why'd you put her in charge? Or, like, here's what the zealots are going to do. Or, bitch, why didn't you speak up earlier? Yeah, there's that too. Like, maybe you could have been like, buddy, this is all cute. But would he have listened to her? I don't know. Because he's an imperial fist and their way is correct. He might have. He might have, and I'm not saying that he wouldn't have because, oh, you're not an adept. Because he seemed to, he respected her. I don't think he trusted her, but he did respect her. And that was because he knew that she was part of the secret. You know, when it came to the... Was she? Well, she knew, I don't know if she knew exactly. But she knew there was a secret and she told him, you should just stop asking about it for your own sake. How are the sisters going to react to this? Well, they're they all, like, aren't they all dead, so... Not all of them. Well, the canonist is dead. Yeah, but there has to be some that are still alive. At least I think she's dead. I can't remember if Laura's died or not now, actually, because I was at the end there. I was just like, ah! And I was so angry about Karos dying. You guys! I was wrecked! That was not cool, man. That was not cool at all! It was... By the way, can I say that that was probably the most badass scene when the minor chick kills that demon? Yeah. I kind of laughed because in the beginning when Karos first sees her, he's just like, oh, she's got a plasma cutter. Interesting weapon, but not too useful right now. And I was like, oh, it's Chekhov's plasma cutter. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad. Um, oh, gosh. That it was her with her with Karos. And, but yeah, I was so pissed when he died. Not but it happy. was funny when they're like, oh, my gosh, you killed the demon. She's like, well, somebody had to. <laughs> And I was telling, telling you and my husband earlier, I was like, oh, and I'm so happy because the minor chick and the new uh, enforcer guy, they're clearly in love now since they squeezed hands. And I was like, oh, there's a romance, buddy. How nice. Oh, you got to love Warhammer 40k romances because they I don't do. last long. <laughs> um, so I like to pretend that the short story from the Night Lords Omnibus with Decimus didn't happen. And there was a happy ending. Um. I live, my world's nice. High 76, low 76, all the time. Um, I want to live in that world. (laughs) (laughs) It's just San Diego, but cheaper. Um, (laughs) (laughs) It's been a week, Mm -hmm. y'all. But yes, this book had everything. Intrigue, secrets, likable word bearers, lots of action, great dialogue. And I'm just going to pretend there was a budding romance at the end. I I laugh. Why you wouldn't? I laughed. I cried. Yeah, this is probably, you know, and it's been a really, because I feel like I've said this a lot where I'm like, this is probably my favorite book of this year, but I don't know if anything's going to surpass this. Well, I got to look at like what's been published this year versus what I've read this year, because, you know, we've read some really good stuff because, I mean, it's this year that we read Dark Imperium and then Plague War and this and then shroud of night and you know other things but Black what was in talon of horus right yeah. what what was actually published this year because talon of horus and black right. legion were not um so we're waiting on the third one of those i guess all the way up to the 13th like <laughs> is that how many we're gonna have one for every crusade i'm down I'd be cool with that, to be honest. As long as I don't. You know, at first we did our podcast, I was like, uh-uh, but now I'm kind of like, bring it on. Um, so long as, you know, Lior Vine, he retcons and he doesn't die. Sure. Sure. He'll be right on that, I'm sure. Don't take this from me, Gary. All right, I didn't. ADB already did. <laughs> <sighs> yes. So, but um, I really, you know... I don't know what's going to top this book for me this year. I love, I loved it so much. And it was such a great read. And I think the other night you finished it before I did. And I was like, oh man, I only have like 70 pages left. And you were like, they go so fast. They did. The book, I mean, once it hits a certain point, you fly through it. So highly, highly recommend this one this year. Oh, absolutely. 
Even though we haven't read the other Conquest books yet, but this one... We will, though. Oh, yes, we, we will, but... I think this is a good one to start with, unless everything else is sucks <laughs> compared to this. Like, oh, what a letdown. I know. Well, you know, so our next book that we're reading um, is Celestine by Andy Clark. I bought mine digitally. Um, but it's wrong it's, side. But look at look at this book, though. I mean, not just thickness, but just. Oh! It's like a little baby book. I know it is. <laughs> With little baby angel wings, but it's not a cherub because those are creepy. Oh God, they're so creepy. Every time they describe them, I'm like, who? Actually, I think all the servitors are creepy. Serva skulls, cyber cherubs, it's all creepy. You're all creepy. Warhammer yeah, 40k. Kind of, the cherubs, I think if I had to like, like on a scale, probably the servitors, the servo, servo skulls and the cyber cherubs, they're just, they're actually like in a class by themselves. They, they really creep me out. Um, but it's I'm really excited for it, especially after reading Shroud of Night, because Andy Clark really won me over with that. Um, it's going to be such a hard act to follow, though. Uh, oh, Shroud of Night or this or both, to be totally honest. Both, actually. Actually, you know what? This was the perfect. I would say this was the perfect companion to Shroud of Night or the perfect follow up. I agree. Right? That book was so crazy. And this was, too, and somehow managed to balance the crazy and the heavy. It wasn't as crazy as like nothing will top will top Shroud of Night in terms of just bonkers. <laughs> I have to say, my kids had on Despicable Me too, and that scene where the minions are coming in with the two axes and running through the I just start bursting out laughing like it's corn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, corn! That's crazy. <laughs> 